Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 41 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my friend and co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, thanks, Zaki. Uh, welcome, everyone, back. Uh, welcome back, everyone, and uh, it's good to be back. And uh, this time we weren't... Uh, we didn't have that big of a hiatus that we did last time, so uh, it's uh, pretty pretty exciting. And it's exciting that to... we are working the way we're supposed to. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's, that's right. the low bar we've set now. Is <laughs> we released an episode and it's not too late. That's right. Hey, man, that's that's what you got to do. You just have to set the bar so low that people's expectations, uh, you know, are, are absolutely minimal. It's like you know Donald Trump in the last debate or something. Well, it's it's like uh, the the high school yearbook quote that I uh, submitted and which was rejected, by the way, by the dean, which was "Strive for mediocrity." That way, when you do good, you surprise yourself. Was that a, was that your actual quote? Yeah, the yearbook people wanted to use that in the in the thing, and and the administration said you can't. <laughs> that's by the way, that's as close as I ever got to being a bad boy in high school. Was having my yearbook quote rejected. <laughs> wow. But regardless, Rebel. regardless, we are back, and we are back with a guest who is also back. Shadi Hamid rejoins us here on Diffuse Congruence. Shadi. Uh, welcome. First of all, thanks for coming back. Hi, Zeki. Hi, Pervez. Thanks so much for, for having me. My pleasure. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I mean, the last time we had you on was, gosh, Pervez, when was it? Oh, God, and you going to throw it to me. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, it's been a while, put it that way. I think, I want to say two years ago, but, uh, um, yeah. All I know for sure is that it was pre-Trump. Okay. Oh, which, <laughs> which which feels like an eternity ago, by the way. <laughs> yes. Pre, <laughs> so, well, yeah, Trump was just a, you know, I, I think at that time, um, a, a, yeah, just a reality star, or maybe it was even off sea, you know, like that, even that show had ended. I don't know. Um, well, well ba back then, uh, Trump was just a horrible sideshow racist bigot, not a horrible sideshow racist bigot who might be leader of the free world. There you go. So we've wow. added another check to, on that list. But regardless, it, it's been too long. However long it was, Shadi, it was too long. And and uh, for those of you listening who need a refresher, Shadi is a senior fellow in the project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world in the Center for Middle East Policy and the author of the new book, Islamic Exceptionalism, How the Struggle Over Islam is Reshaping the World. His previous book, Temptations of Power, Islamists in Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East, was named a Foreign Affairs Best Book of 2014. Hamid served as director of research at the Brookings Doha Center until 20, 2014 January and prior to joining Brookings he was director of research at the project on Middle East democracy and a Hewlett fellow at Stanford University Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law Shadi is a contributing writer for the Atlantic and the vice chair of POMED's board of directors Shadi again welcome back to Diffuse Congruence thanks so much so yeah lots you know to talk actually about, lots to talk about yeah, there is. Uh, and, and by the way, it was August 2014, by the way. Uh, it was the end of August we had Shadi on. Wow. And so, um, More than two years. Uh, we were just past our single digit. Uh, you know, we were just growing up, Zucky. We were <laughs> episode 10. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, as Zucky was saying, it's great to have you back, Shadi. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to kind of pick up where we had left off. I mean, I, I know last time where, when we had you on the show, um, we were still, you know, we were sort of, sort of like, well, not just we, but you know, pretty much the world over was just still reeling from what was happening in the Middle East in terms of the Arab Spring or the so-called Arab Spring and and the uh, and the uh, the revolution and then things going back to normal as it were in in Egypt and 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 uh, and things like that. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess with uh, what's with, with all the goings on right now, um, maybe perhaps picking up the conversation. Uh, there a little bit, maybe focusing on Syria, because I mean, right now, obviously, uh, Syria uh, and, and so much what's going on over there is seems to be in the news, and obviously, just a, a lot of just some real tragic tr tragic news coming out of Syria almost on a daily basis. So, um, you know, kind of, what are your thoughts about Syria and and how perhaps from the Arab Spring, um, you know, what, what's happening in Syria today can be kind of connected to to those events like two plus years ago. So even even just hearing you mention the word Syria, I just felt this sense of exhaustion come upon me. It's 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 just it's so, you know, it was really bad by 2013, 
And it was always a question of would it get worse and how worse would it get? 2014 was worse, then 2015 was worse, then 2016 was worse than that. And you keep on thinking to yourself, you know, what's the limit here? Um, and, uh, it, you know, it just makes it, I think all of our conversations about the Middle East, um, you know, th they're sort of colored by this, this kind of dep sense of depression. And sometimes you feel almost fatalistic about it. I mean, what, you know, what can we really do? And in some sense, I think that the big change or, so in August 2014, when we were talking last, that was sort of when ISIS was coming to the fore. Mm -hmm. And um, it just earlier that summer taken over the second largest city in Iraq. And so ISIS becomes the, the kind of the, the, um, the headline dominator. Uh, but, you know, and ISIS has actually lost considerable ground since then. So that's one of the few bright spots that we can point to. But I think one thing that's really become more and more clear to me over time is that once, you know, once, maybe it even sounds a bit like a cliche and it's self-evident, but once history happens, it's kind of too late. So the fact that 2014 happened has effects for a long time to come. And even if we do all the right things now, even if we find ways to improve policy, um, even if we hypothetically had a great president who was amazing on the Middle East, which will probably never happen in our lifetimes, you know, even with all those things, we can't undo the damage that the rise of ISIS has caused. And even if we defeated ISIS tomorrow morning, literally, um, the legacy of ISIS would still be with us. Um, and in just one example of what I mean by that is, you know, anytime there's an ungoverned or ungovernable space somewhere in the Middle East, you're going to have your local extremist group thinking to itself, hey, ISIS is the gold standard. Um, and we don't want to just blow things up. We also want to capture, hold, and govern territory. So it's this really pronounced interest in governance that sets ISIS apart when we're looking at the broader, the broader sweep of extremist groups. And so that, that happened already. And, um, and the fact that almost half a million people have been killed in Syria, that's happened. And it's going to... We're going to live with the effects of Syria. So, we, you know, Syria deserves to be the number one issue that everyone that that everyone in the U.S., Europe, the Middle East, whatever, is talking about right now, because it's not just going to. I mean, th this presumption that Syria could be contained has been has been proven to be a hundred percent wrong. I mean, there were actually senior U.S. officials saying that kind of nonsense in 2011, 2012, and now we're, how, now we're seeing how Syria, um, it, doesn't just, it, it doesn't just affect the Middle East, but it also affects the future of the European project. It's contributed in some way, indirectly or directly, to the rise of far-right populist parties in Europe, and for God's sake, even the Trump phenomenon. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Lot, no, lot sorry, to unpack sorry, there. To, sorry, sorry to start on that. <laughs> no, but I mean, I guess, I guess my question is why, why is it not as much of a topic of conversation? Because it, you know, I mean, we've got, you know, Gary Johnson's famous Aleppo moment. I think for, for as much grief as he took, I think he represents the vast majority of people in this country who have no idea what Aleppo is. <laughs> yeah, well... For, you know, first of all, when someone when someone on a TV show asks you something, and you have no idea what they're talking about. There's always a way to sort of like pretend. <laughs> right. So he could have just been like, "Oh, okay." He could have just been like something. Oh well, um, yeah. The situation <laughs> is really difficult, and we're going to have to look more closely at that. And you know, I'm really concerned, Mike. I mean, that's all you have to do, right? Um, anyway, but Gary Johnson clearly is not good at that. But I think it's also a little bit unfair that we're giving Gary Johnson so much grief. Fine, he doesn't know Aleppo. He doesn't focus on international affairs. I mean, his agenda is to focus less on foreign affairs. I think that if we're comparing problems, 
I think that I think the fact that Obama has been qu quite frankly terrible on Syria hmm. and his policies have contributed directly to the humanitarian catastrophe that we're seeing. So Democrats are going around, uh, you know, and criticizing Gary Johnson. Fine, but at least save some of that for your um, for for Barack Obama, the head of your own party, who whose actions have been much worse on Syria or in or in actions, I should say, than anything Gary Johnson could have possibly said. Hmm. Wow. But so, here, I mean, I should also I should also say, look, yeah. I mean, I, I was so I was home last weekend um, and um, I was talking to my mom and I was I was about to do an in interview and she said, Shadi, you know, sometimes you're 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 really mean to Obama, and you got to take it easy on him a little bit. He's trying; he's a good guy. And look at his hair; his hair is gray now. Come on, give the guy a break. But yeah, I mean, so I, I am being a little bit mean to Obama, but I think that he, that's what's so sad about this is that I do think President Obama is a good person. I do think he wants to, in his own way, help make the world a better place. Um, I think he knows better. So he doesn't have the same kind of excuse that maybe other presidents would have had, like George W. Bush. Um, I'm not sure if George W. Bush was in the same kind of way, just a genuinely good person in the way that I think Obama is. There's a kind of integrity that, that Obama seems to express, or maybe he's just a good actor. I don't know. Hmm. But I mean, I think that's what makes it really sad that he could have been so much better. And I think it's also sad that this will taint his domestic legacy. And I think domestically I have my issues with Obama, but at least, you know, there's some major things to be proud of in that in that record. Absolutely. But the fact that we're always going to have to add this asterisk whenever we talk about Obama for the rest of our lives, we'll say, oh, well, he was really good on universal health care, gay marriage, or whatever it might be. But there is this taint. Actually, it's not a taint. It's a bloody stain on his legacy. And it's Syria. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's too late now. Wow. Well, well, I, I, I mean, I, you've mentioned it a, a couple of times now, at the very least. Uh, where, where do you, where, like, where does your sort of, uh, where, where, you know, when you fault Obama for his legacy vis-a-vis -vis Syria, uh, where does that begin? Uh, what, what, what should he have done differently? What was the original sin there? Yeah, there you go. Oh boy, original sins. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, so the problem here is that there were so many opportunities to get it right. It was just, you know, sometimes you get one moment wrong and you try to learn from your mistake and adjust and whatever. Um, but the problem is we've been having the same conversation for the past five years. So I came out in support of military intervention against the Assad regime in early 2012. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, I think that was, I think that that's when the conversation started. And I remember that a lot of us were like, oh my God, the death toll has gotten to somewhere around 7,000. And we thought that was intolerable. I was like, in, in Libya, uh, before the NATO operation started in March 2011, Somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 people had been killed. We thought that was really bad. 7,000 seemed a lot worse. So the fact that it was 7,000 then when we started this conversation, and now it's, it's half a million. I mean, just think about that for a second. Hmm. And I remember, you know, having discussions where we would debate, hey, um, wh where do you think Obama or the international community's red line is when it comes to the death toll of Syrians. And I, I remember on Twitter, I put out the number 15,000. Oh, God. I mean, how naive was I to actually think that that could be the case? But I think what one lesson that... So I've learned a couple lessons. Um, so I've never... Maybe when I was, you know, at a different point in my life when I was, when I was quite a bit younger... I, you know, I, like a lot of people, I went through a sort of like a leftist, anti-imperialist, sort of cliched um, year or two and reading Chomsky and thinking that I had found the truth or whatever, some, you know, some crap like that. And, um, you know, I still see myself as a child of the left. And I feel like, uh, you know, it was very much 
formed by certain experiences I had during the anti-war movement in um, when Iraq was happening, for example, and the whole Bush era, of course, of seeing the dangers of militarism and this kind of um, unchecked adventurism abroad. But I think one thing that I've increasingly come to realize over time is that the the use of U.S. military force is absolutely essential to a peace to a more peaceful world. And I actually tweeted something to that effect the other day on Twitter. And like people who I'd never even seen on Twitter, who are like on the hard left, just like coming out in droves, attacking me in very like harsh personal terms, perhaps misunderstanding what I meant. So, like none of us are going to disagree with the basic fact that the U as the US has a tragic history of, of involvement abroad. The US military has done bad things. There have been disastrous consequences, whether it's in Iraq or Vietnam. Let's and that's not even talking about the coups that we supported in Latin America. I mean it's a long history and we can all recite we can all recite those things. But then that doesn't mean that the very fact of the U.S. military or the very idea of U.S. military force is intrinsically bad or harmful. And I think we've gotten to this point, a lot of people on the left, for them it's not about better outcomes, it's about fighting imperialism, namely the U.S., irrespective of the outcomes that the U.S. produces abroad. So hypothetically, let's say that the U.S. military, what if the U.S. military could stop at least some of the killing in Syria? I don't think that's the primary question for many on the hard left, um, because I think it's very clear. Empirically, we know that the U.S. military is capable, like no, like no other force, of at least trying to stop genocide or mass killing. Who else is going to do it? And that's the open question that I pose to people. If the US if the US and its allies are not going to step in today in Aleppo, who will? There is no answer to that question. So in a, in an ideal world we'd say of course, you know, because of America's legacy, you know, um, the US has done a lot of harm. We 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 might wish that there could be a better alternative, but we live in a world where that alternative does not exist and where the actual alternatives in real life are considerably worse. So as bad as a US-led international order might be, think about the alternative of a Russian-led international order or a Chinese-led international order or no international order at all where the US essentially says, hey, we're done with this whole thing. We're not going to use our military for anything except defending the borders of the homeland. We will not be there for our NATO allies. We will not be there for Europe. We will not be there in any, ca in any case of genocide for the, rest, for, the, for, for the rest of our life. For the next 50 years, God knows how many you know, situations of mass slaughter and or genocide there will be in the, in the next 50 years. And in every single instance, the U.S. will say, that's not our job, and genocide and mass slaughter will continue unabated. Is that the world we want to live in? I mean, for me, that's the fundamental question. Hmm. Wow. So, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think, yeah. Well, it, it, and I, and I, when I asked the question, I mean, I, I didn't want to ask with the leading sort of, well, you know, um, because I, I know that you argue for a more of a sort of interventionalist sort of policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria, but but uh, um, and I and I'm wondering, do you do you cite do you look at instances, say for example, in Libya where that has been successful, whether that's been U.S. led or or NATO led? Um, but but what about instances where it's been a complete disaster, say arguably or Iraq? Uh, so how do you how do you sort of temper what you know what I mean like what you're saying in terms of the success stories of the past with some of the catastrophes that have also resulted because by way of military intervention? Okay, so let's look at let's say the last twenty five years. Let's kind right. of focus post Cold War. Yeah. Um, obviously, Iraq stands out, but um, so I'm in the minority on this, um, but I, I don't consider Libya a failure. I actually would put that in the success column. 
Which um, is why I it. How I characterize you. <laughs> yeah, the, because I knew that's sort of where, yeah. And I'd love for you to talk about why that's the case and, and why you perhaps go uh, sort, of, sort of, you know, swim against the stream in that regard as well, in terms of arguing for the fact that Libya has been over, over, overall a success story. Yeah, so, okay, so I think that when people say Libya is a mess now, look, we all agree that that's the case. But you can't compare the le the mess that Libya currently is to some kind of ideal state. So even the way we do comparative analysis is messed up. We're always comparing something to the wrong other thing, whatever that might be. Yes, Libya is not a, de a stable democracy, but that was not the goal of the NATO intervention. There was mass killing going on in real time. And Gaddafi was telegraphing that he was more than willing to do more mass killing. And it was a zero-sum game. By that time, people had taken up arms to defend themselves. And um, was the opposition just going to sort of throw their hands up if Gaddafi marched towards Benghazi and they were on the losing side? No, they were going to fight. And Gaddafi was going to fight until the very end. So I... I, I remember the feeling that I had at that time when we weren't sure if the NATO intervention was actually going to happen because the decision wasn't made until very late in the game. And there was there was a lot of back and forth within the Obama administration about making that decision. And there was considerable re reluctance in early March. So, you know, we didn't know if it was going to happen. And I was saying to myself, wait a second. We have a, a brutal dictator who's saying to the world, he's announcing it on live television, that he is willing to go alleyway by alleyway and kill his own people, and we're not gonna and we're and we're not gonna do anything about it. Not only that, the Arab League had come out in support. Many of our Arab allies had come out in support of military intervention. The French, the British, and the one thing that was missing again, this is an important lesson for me at least. The one thing that was missing was the U.S. and you know, I think what's become clear in the world that we live in is that if the U.S. doesn't set the tone, if the U.S. doesn't lead in some way, others are not going to do it, you know, because they're not going to expose themselves to that risk unless they know that the world's most powerful actor is behind them. So I think that in, in that sense, the Libya operation was a success because it, it stopped Gaddafi's mass killing, and it actually gave Libyans a chance for the first time in decades to forge their own future. Now, the second civil war, the one that's currently happening now, didn't start until 2014. So there's a two and a half, um, about a two year gap between the end of a NATO operation and the start of the second Libyan civil war. So how can you blame the latter on the former when there's this big gap in between we have to sort of we have to ask ourselves the question wait did, did something happen in between so that there's a kind of causal issue there it's not the original intervention that caused the current civil war in my view what's um what's more to blame is the fact that we washed our hands of libya and the world forgot about libya because we we felt that the dictator was gone you know, Libyans will be able to figure out figure it out. They have a lot of oil wealth. The population isn't that large. They got certain things going for them. And Libyans were wondering, where has the international community gone? So I think that's why we have to we have to go out of our way to separate intervention from post intervention. So that's how I feel about that's how I feel about Libya. And if you I think that if we hadn't intervened in Libya, Libya would look more like Syria looks today. Um, and I think that's what we have to realistically compare uh, Libya to. I think that worst case, or at least worst case scenario, uh, worst case scenario, um, would have been you know somewhat likely. I can't prove that, but the point of stepping in to prevent mass killing is you don't take the chance. You can't prove that a million Rwandans are going to be killed, but you you know that it's moving perhaps in that direction of mass slaughter. And then you you don't wait you don't wait till the pe you don't wait till the million are killed to act and say oh now we know how bad it is right so but just to kind of answer your question on some of the other interventions you know um, Kosovo.
Bosnia. I'll, I'll even include here Kuwait um, in the first Gulf War in 1991. I think it was a good thing that Saddam's Iraq did not gobble up Kuwait, a sovereign state, however flawed that sovereign state might be. So, I mean, um, I'm happy that there was, an, there was a military force led by the U.S., that um, the, the, the Gulf War was just, it was necessary. Um, so I think that you look at those examples and you sort of see, you sort of see the counter to Iraq. And of course, no one's going to, and I, you know, I was against, you know, I was against the Iraq war from, from day one. I was, I was involved in the anti-war movement and I felt very passionately about that. Um, and I still do. I think, how did we actually do this? But we can't, we, first of all, let's not learn the wrong lessons from the last war. Let's not overlearn the wrong lessons or even the right lessons for that matter. Not everything is Iraq. And this is what I, I oftentimes, you know, I'll talk about intervention or Libya or whatever. And then someone will say, well, what about Iraq? And then I think to myself, yes, what about Iraq? Iraq is not Syria. These are actually two different countries in two completely different contexts. So in Iraq in 2003, we intervened and then a civil war resulted. In Syria, it's the exact reverse. It's a civil war happened in the absence of U.S. intervention. So they're so, they're so drastically incomparable as to make the question absurd in my view. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all valid points. Uh, absolutely, um, I, you know, I think that there's a general tendency just because the the similarities, you know, there or the similarities that do exist between, say, Iraq, Syria, uh, as, as well as Libya, being that you know you had these strong arm sort of dictators, brutal dictators, uh, in, in 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 all these cases, uh, and so uh, you know authoritarian regimes, and so people just sort of painted with that with this broad stroke. Uh, it's interesting how you point out that, you know, what's happening, what happened in Syria, at least, that's led up to what's what, what's going on right now is sort of the opposite of what happened in Iraq, which is a civil war and the uh, post-intervention versus here, we're talking about a civil war that has erupted where we aren't intervening or there hasn't been an intervention. Um, however, what I find interesting in sort of both the it, both the instances of, or I guess all the instances mentioned, Iraq, Syria, and Lib and Libya, is that, you know, these aren't whether it's Assad or whether it was Gaddafi or or, or Saddam Hussein. I mean, these aren't people. These aren't these aren't bad actors who started acting up uh, in the last, you know, in in recent memory. I mean, for as long as they've they had, they had either held power or held, or hold power today, they've been brutal dictators. So what? You know, for, you you asked for sort of what becomes then the sort of red line beyond which you say, okay, you know, this is where intervention becomes, uh, be, be becomes, uh, you know, the only solution. Uh, I guess where do we draw that threshold, right? Because in the case of Assad, he's been this way for since I mean, you know, as far as back as I can remember, uh, and his father was no better. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, before 2011, yes, Essid was, of course, a brutal di dictator, but there wasn't, there wasn't a specific ongoing case of mass slaughter or genocide. So for me, that's the standard, because if it's just about being a brutal dictator, I mean, that would be like, what, 40 countries? And, you know, some of them are, you know, and there's just, we, we, I think we can all agree that the U.S. can't go around toppling every single bad dictator, Right. Even you know, even if we might want to theoretically, there's a there's a resources and capacity issue. The U.S. is not capable of doing that, obviously. Okay, but um, so that's why I think that, um, and I think there is. I'm not a big fan of sovereignty arguments, but there still is something called sovereignty in the international system, and R2P as as has been. You know, formalized through various international institutions, um, including uh, the UN. Uh, the responsibility to, to protect um, is not about just being a brutal dictator. It's it's about situations where leaders are essentially killing their own people or failing to protect their civilians from mass slaughter, essentially. So I think that is pretty much a standard that I have in mind. 
And, and obviously, we can't intervene in every case of mass slaughter. And I don't like this argument. It, in some ways, it, 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 it might sound logical at first, but then when you really think about it, it's not super logical. It's just, hey, you know, there's, what about the mass slaughter in the Congo? And I'm not, I don't understand... I don't understand what's driving this kind of whataboutism, we might call it. Okay, um, so just because a slaughter, so if a slaughter is happening in Congo, that means we can stop a slaughter where, where we can and where we're willing somewhere else. That seems like a morally problematic argument. But I mean, there is no, in many cases, there will not be an international discussion or an interna international awareness or a willingness of the U.S., and a considerable number of its allies to act. So obviously there are other things that go into any decision to intervene. What's so striking about Syria is that, <clears throat> you know, uh, many of our allies have been begging, literally begging us uh, to get more, more involved. So whether it's Arab allies, France, Britain at a certain point, I mean, the list goes on. And in August 2013, French jets were ready. Um, they had a list of targets, but at the 11th hour, Obama backed down um, and really kind of, you know, left left some of our closest allies in the lurch, including even members of his own administration who presumed that an intervention was was proceeding, but didn't happen. So I think that, um, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to call for the U.S. to be some human rights NGO that goes around um you know, uh, intervening and overthrowing dictators everywhere right. in the world. Right. So we also, there has to be some aspect of realism. So people accuse me of being unrealistic, which is fine. People accuse me of a lot of things. But, um, you know, there, uh, I'm, not, I'm not calling for an unimaginable world. Everything that I'm calling for is actually possible today. And, you know, we know this because... We have senior military officers and former senior military officers who are saying that this can be done now. And, you know, someone like General Petraeus just came out the other day and said, you know, this act, you know, the Assad regime is not some, uh, you know, some great military power. I mean, what it's also we're talking about the, the, the strongest, greatest military the world has ever seen compared to Assad. I mean, come on, like, I don't even think that's a little bit disingenuous to me when people say, oh, well, um, air defense is the Assad regime. They have a strong army. It's it's to me, it's it's deflection. Hmm. Right. OK. Um, now, if, if if you were to be able to look into your look into your crystal ball and assume then that either somehow in the last final days of this administration or the or the next administration, and we'll get to talking about domestic affairs in just a little bit, but um, uh, were, to, were to take out a seat, were, were, to, were, were to, you know, dethrone Assad. What happens at that point? Like, where do you, where do you see Syria going with regards to the present condition of the civil war, the role that ISIS is playing in that, and, uh, and obviously Russian and Chinese, and, or not Chinese, sorry, Russian interest, where do you see all of that playing out? Assuming that well, again, or 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 even if if Obama had done exactly as you prescribed. Okay. Well, one thing that I think is important here is so when I talk about um, intervention against Assad, that does not necessarily mean regime change. I think Obama, mm. Obama himself, has often used this as a straw man. Oh, look at these people. They want they want to do Iraq all over again, or they want regime change, or this and that. And not actually looking at what those of us who support intervention actually say in real life. And um, so I think there's there's a basic kind of um, the basic idea is you first of all, it's about stopping mass killing. I mean, that's the number one priority, irrespective of the status of Assad. What you want to do is diminish the Assad regime's ability to kill. And the only way you can do that is by targeting um, the the vehicles or, or the instruments of that killing. So you have to target military infrastructure. Um, the question of regime change is a different one, but I think at the very least what, what military force does is that um, it at least provides an opportunity for real negotiations on a more balanced playing field. The idea is to at least, you know, perhaps with a credible threat of military force, 
Hesed will be induced to negotiate in good faith, or something resembling good faith at least a percentage of the time. Um, and that's sort of what the um, the Bosnia Kos you know, Kosovo model was to some extent in that um, Milosevic, there wasn't regime change against Milosevic. Milosevic came to the negotiating table. Um, so the credible threat of military force is supposed to, so it's not even always about actual military force, and it depends obviously on the context. The problem now is that we no longer have a credible threat of military force in the international system because no one believes what the U.S. says. So when the U.S. says there's a red line, if Assad does X, Y, and Z, Assad doesn't believe there's a red line there. Russia doesn't believe it. I don't believe it. You don't. And I can't tell you the number of meetings I've been in with senior policymakers and officials um, in, in Europe and, and multilateral institutions, whatever it might be, where someone brings up the phrase red line and people start chuckling. We live in a world where the idea of U.S. credibility, of respecting its own red lines, even our closest allies in Europe can't keep a straight face. And so that has an effect beyond Syria. And again, this is why when we talk about Syria, we're not just talking about Syria. We're talking about an international system which is falling apart. But in terms of, um, uh, so, so for me, that's why I put, you know, the regime change conversation. Um, and also, I think what's important is no one is calling for erasing the Syrian state. We're not talking about a total dismantling of every single state institution. Um, and again, we have to be realistic here. You don't want to have a total power vacuum. And I think it's, it's reasonable to be concerned about that. But so the solution isn't to say, well, we don't know what's going to happen the day after. This is always what people say. OK, if you don't know what's going to happen the day after, there is another option. You can become more aware of the day after. You can actually you can actually concentrate considerable resources and attention as a government to answering that question and looking at what the U.S., what the U.S. role will be along with its allies in post-conflict stabilization. Will there be multinational peacekeeping forces in certain parts of Syria? What do you do about the Russian threat? How do you try to mitigate that and avoid, to the extent that you can, unnecessary confrontations? I mean, there is a lot of planning that has to go into this. So when people say, well, there isn't, um, there isn't a blueprint for success, first of all, there is no such thing as guaranteed success in conflict or post-conflict, and especially not in the Middle East. But that, that almost presumes that what we're doing now has somehow been successful. And we're, we're saying, hey, things are okay now, so why are we considering any alternatives? What we do know empirically is that what we've tried the past five years has been a disastrous failure. So it's incumbent upon U.S. policymakers who have been a part of this failed policy to readjust. That's the most you can expect from any human being after a set of mistakes have been have have been done. And the fact that we don't hold the Obama administration to the same standard that we hold the Bush administration. So we all agree that empirically the Iraq war was a disaster. We can analyze it after the fact and we can look at all the things that went wrong. And I think rightfully the Bush administration's legacy has been permanently tar tarnished as a result. The fact that my my um, my comrades on the left are not willing to do anything comparable when it comes to Obama, I think is really concerning to me. So I think there's also a kind of inbuilt partisan bias that because we like Obama, we don't want to hold him to the very same standard that we held Bush to. Hmm. Uh, all good points, Shadi. And I, I think that... <laughs> hey, listen, well, you guys are... You're you're free to disagree with me. Don't no, feel no, no. I mean, I, I, I think I think where you know, uh, I, I tried at least to the best that I could, sort of voice, uh, uh, you know, what 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 someone who would fundamentally disagree yeah. with, with with what you're arguing would essentially argue. Um, obviously, there's a lot to discuss, and 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 I mean, we do yeah. we do at the same time want to have you comment on uh, a few other issues as well. So I, I think. Sure, uh, yes. 
having discussed Syria uh, pretty extensively so far, I, I, I'd, I'd want to. I'd like to pivot this conversation into um, your new book, which is uh, Islamic Exceptionalism: How the Struggle Over Islam Is Reshaping the World. Um, one of the one of the things one of the sort of often refrains that Muslims certainly in the West uh, at least I've, I I I hear more often than say Muslims back home argue for when it comes to organizations or when it comes to groups like ISIS but certainly in the modern in the case right now with ISIS is that well ISIS doesn't represent Islam. Um, now I'm not going to just throw you out there and say that you're arguing that <laughs> the complete opposite of that. However, that is sort of the subject of your new book, which is to sort of unpack how or the relationship that Islam has had with the political establishment that is uniquely that is unique to it, uh, un uh, unlike say the re the relationship that Christianity, at least at its genesis, had with regards to political power. Yeah. So, um, well, there's a lot there. <laughs> where, yeah. well, let me, I'm just thinking where I should start on this. So, on on, on the um, so what I, what I tried to do in my in my new book is, I really wanted to get into this question of how much does religion matter when we're trying to understand the rise of ISIS or the collapse of the Arab Spring. I think there's a lot of confusion around. Hey. Is this about religion? Is it about politics? Is it about power? Is it some kind of mix of all those different things? And I think that there's a discomfort in talking seriously and frankly about the power and relevance of religion. And I think that, you know, we as American Muslims are, are sensitive to this because we're worried that people will think that we're, we're different or that our religion is different. And you know, what I argue, what I argue in the book is that, hey, if we, you know, there's no way to get around this. Maybe we're not different as American Muslims, whatever that might mean. I don't even know what that means. But certainly Islam, certainly Islam is different than other major religions. It's certainly different than Christianity. And Islam is, as the title of the book suggests, exceptional in how it relates to law, politics, and governance. But I'm not kind of, I'm not what I think is important for us to do when we talk about this is to maybe, I'm not sure if it's the best way to put it, but suspend judgment. And I think we have to sort of put our personal biases to the side and say, hey, we as, as products of the American secular, um, we, um, we might be suspicious of religion playing certain roles in, in government. Um, you know, a lot of us are built in that's just a built-in part of how we look at the world. And, you know, living in the Northeastern elite corridor, let's be honest, like in, 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 elite, in elite circles, and elite now, of course, is a bad word, there aren't, um, you don't meet a lot of, like, super intense religious um, Christians and, and Jews. Um, you know, it's just not super common in, in some of these circles. So I think a lot of the people who are making policy or a lot of people in, um, in media or people who are part of the public debate, sometimes it can be hard to really relate to the power that Islam holds or seems to hold in any number of countries among any number, number of millions of people. Um, and I think that it doesn't help us to pretend that's not the case. And because it's also sort of obvious to anyone who can like read a Wikipedia page that there is something about Islam that doesn't seem like Christianity. So people who don't know anything, any, like any anything that much about about the religions in question, they'll get a sense of it, right? So when we come and tell them, hey, you know, ISIS has absolutely zero zero percent to do with religion. Come on, I mean, self evidently absurd to even say that. Of course, that doesn't mean that ISIS is representative of Islam. And I think we all know by now the disclaimer that the overwhelming majority of Muslims oppose ISIS. So ISIS represents a very tiny sliver of overall um, Muslim thought. But that doesn't mean that they don't take religion seriously in their own way, that they don't believe that what they're doing is commanded by God. And I think to discount the religious motivations of religious actors is problematic and reflects a very kind of post-enlightenment secular blind spot. And I think it's time to kind of, you know, we should be beyond that at this point. 
but the um, and I think there's almost a kind of reverse. I don't know what to call it, the reverse essentialism or reverse orientalism, where a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, they're very well-meaning liberals, right? And they'll say things like, oh, you know, we went through our own 30 years war or 100 years war, whatever war in the medieval era, God knows what. And hey, you know, we got through it. You know, you learn from violence and you exhaust your religious passions. And hey, you Muslims, you'll get there. You know, you're just going through some growing pains. And come on, you know, it's... It's patronizing, but it's it's historically and analytically problematic to compare. Why would Islam follow the same trajectory as Christianity? So one thing I try to unpack is how we should look at this comparison. I have a I have nearly an entire chapter which looks at the evolution of Christianity and its relationship to law, politics, and governance throughout you know different eras leading up to the present day, and you know. It's a different history, a different evolution, but also importantly, a different starting point. Different religions have different founding moments, and founding moments matter, right? Um, anyway, yeah, there's a lot there, so I'll just I'll just stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 almost like we we need a whole separate conversation because we've got so much stuff we still want to cover about. Uh, what you're talking about and how it ties in with with domestic policy which i mean we've spent the first half of the show talking about uh the international scene and i think i mean i think sort of the the frustrating thing which you alluded to is that uh in a lot of ways it doesn't matter who's sitting in the oval office foreign policy regardless of party seems to be sort of the same when it comes to dealing with with the, the middle east and the muslim world yeah um well so I don't think it's the same. I mean, it's it's bad, but in different ways. Sure, so, I mean, sure. Obama is very different than Bush on foreign policy, but they're both bad in their own kind of way. So I, I do sort of share... D different think, so degrees I think what, of badness. Yeah, exactly. But I think one way to address that is to, you know, people, people should make an extra effort, especially in the West, to understand Islam on its own terms. And I think one thing that's become you know, increasingly clear to me is I've been very interested in learning more about my own religion, including for this book. So, I, you know, I had to dive in and sort of either reacquaint myself with things that I had forgotten about or dive into new areas of, you know, theology, moral philosophy, whatever it might be. And, you know, Islam is a complicated religion. And, you know, I think some of us, we grow up, you know, in Muslim communities and people like to say, oh, Islam is simple. <laughs> You know, and they, they make it in this yeah. very kind of like, hey, you pray, you fast, there's this oneness of God, Tawheed, it's clear, done. You know, when you actually study Islam, you're like, huh. You know, yeah. I, I kept on thinking to myself, if I wasn't already Muslim, I would have a lot of difficulty understanding this religion, especially kind of as, let's say, an American Christian or an American Jew who's coming from his or her own tradition and to try to make that jump where, um, I mean, just, you know, you just, the way, the, the way that God infuses everyday life in many Middle Eastern countries and where certain things just aren't even questioned and they're just so there that you even start to forget that they're happening around you. And I think that that's just a very different cultural and religious environment. Um, I think that ha there has to be an effort to understand it, but not to understand it, to condemn it, or to kind of superimpose our preconceived notions about the badness of religion. So, hey, look, I mean, um, I personally, as an American small L liberal, I'm skeptical about religion and government. I don't, I don't like the idea. Personally, I wouldn't want to live under, in a, in a, in a state where an Islamist party came to power through democratic means. That's not my scene, right? That's not right. what I, that's not how I want to live my life. Right. You know, yeah. but that's not, I'm not, we're not talking about me or you. Um, and it doesn't matter what I like. It matters what people who are voting like. And also I think there's this other side that religion can play in sometimes a positive role in public life. Religion can provide a sense of, coherence where nationalism hasn't been able to offer that in in contexts where a sense of political community is weak 
religion can help bring people together. It can, it can, because in the end, we're all searching for meaning, right? And this idea that we can live in a post ideological utopia where people don't believe in anything strongly enough, which is sort of the ultimate liberal fantasy. Like anytime you express too strong a belief, a kind of small L liberal will be like, oh, you know, but, um, but I think that what we've learned, and maybe this ties into some of what we're seeing on the domestic scene, is that there is a kind of fundamental weakness in the liberal order. Why? Because it's not enough to go and tell people and say, hey, um, find out your own conception of the good life. And we're not, you know, just, just do it. Whatever you find, you know, do your yoga, find your 27 different jars of jar in the supermarket and choose which one you like. And, um, <laughs> well, I mean, that's also a specific reference to the paradox of choice. Sorry. But, um, right. so this idea that, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, we know from behavioral economics that if you want jam and you go to the supermarket and they give you 27 different kinds and you choose one, you're going to end up being less content or happy with your decision because you're going to wonder about the other 26. On the other hand, if you restricted choice and there was more, there was more direction or coherence and you were just choosing from three or four, you come out feeling better about your choice. But I feel, I feel like we live in this world, we live in this kind of secular age where, you know, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming and that's why we're all struggling to find our own sense of meaning from different places. And I think, why is it that a growing number of people in Europe are turning towards far-right populism or, or, um, or ethno-nationalist parties or white nativism, white nativism in our own country, that there seems to be this ideological and religious vacuum and people are looking for things to fill that vacuum with. And I think we have to be cognizant of that that we live in a world where ideas and ideology matter and we can't just, we can't rid the public sphere of ideas. Um, we can't just all be left of center technocrats who do it like economic tinkering around the margins and we just try to like, we try to fix the market to produce better outcomes. This is, this is not, this is not who we are. This is not, this is not human. This is contrary to everything we know about human nature. Well, speaking of, uh, uh, you know, white nationalism and far right populism, I mean, obviously, we're sort of in the thick of that right now uh, with the current election. And, I, you know, I, I can certainly speak for Pervez that I, I, I would love to get your take on everything going on right now. And given that the last time we talked was before Trumpism became, uh, you know, a, a political affiliation. I mean, what do you think about where we're at? I mean, we're about a month out from election day and certainly i don't think any of us when this all started could have imagined that donald trump would have a 50 percent chance in that he is one of two choices for being president uh, of being president so uh what what are your thoughts okay I, we should probably note to listeners that we are having this discussion after yeah donald trump said the crazy um i mean um, well, I don't even know how to describe it. I know, and, and that's almost sort of become like, well, oh, Donald Trump just said something crazy right before we started recording. <laughs> we, you can trace that back for the last 16 months. So, um, <laughs> this yeah. time, a lot of people have reached their breaking point. Oh, this I, is a family well, friend. You know, so, so it's a family no, friendly no, 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 show, I, so I can't say exactly what Trump <laughs> said, but very kind yeah. of misogynistic yeah. comments about groping These women were, and, and yeah. things like that. So it seems like, you know, hey, maybe, maybe this has gone too far and he's going to lose he's going to lose significant support from his own whatever but i think that 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 provides some sense of relief for me at least for now and maybe that'll change by the time this this podcast comes out but i think the, the broader the broader um i think what's concerning here is that there are somewhere around i don't know whatever it is 30 40 percent of americans yeah. who are willing to support a explicitly illiberal politician for president illiberal in the sense of someone who doesn't seem to share the kind of small l liberal values of non-negotiable rights and freedoms as enshrined in the constitution the bill of rights his targeting of minority groups of um 
He just seems ambivalent. You know, the fact that here's someone who refuses to disavow FDR's internment of Japanese Americans. Like, we don't even remember that's actually Trump's. Like, Trump actually did that. People don't even remember that because it's like, wait, really? That right. seems bad, but is it really worse than the other things he said or done? We don't know. Um, <laughs> right. Right. So I, I no, think that it's. It tells you something that even in a kind of um, the the most successful democracy in the world, or uh, what we as Americans think is the most successful democracy in the world, at least until a few years ago, whatever, that this this was possible. I think that tells us something about the fragility of both small L liberalism. And also I think it tells us that democracy, you, you know, this is why, you know, I, I wrote a piece a few months back where I said, hey, um, you know, Donald Trump frightens me, especially as an American Muslim. And like my life might actually change if Donald Trump wins. So it's not like a kind of academic discussion that we're having. Right. Uh, my life will change in any number of ways, like personally, but also professionally. Hmm. The things that I write will change. Um, the way we write about U.S. foreign policy will change. So literally every single day of my life will have been altered in some way. Anyway, putting yeah. that aside, um, I think that, um, okay, I, was, I think I was on my way to a really profound point. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I... I, I <laughs> I, I, I think I know. I, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of empathize with where you're Sorry, going. I just, so I was going to say, um, yeah, that as frightening as Trump as Trump is, if if he ends up being our democratically elected president, it's a small chance, but let's say it happens for some reason. You know, I will have to respect that democratic outcome, and I think there's something very important about the sanctity. Of, democ of electoral democracy and democratic outcomes. And I wouldn't, want a, I wouldn't want a situation where essentially there's a question over whether or not he's legitimately elected. Um, because I just, that reminds me of what I hear in the Middle East all the time, that if you don't like democratic outcomes, so in other words, if Islamists win and you don't like Islamists, you support a military coup. It's just scary to me that really for the first time in God knows how long, we actually have to have a conversation about the role of the military in a, in a Trump presidency. And people joke about it, but it's only half joking where um, former CIA director, um, you know, Michael Hayden actually talked about with, with Bill Maher on real time. They actually had a, like a little, a little back and forth, which seemed amusing, but actually kind of there was something deeper there about, um, would the military obey Donald Trump? Military coups? What you know? What what does that mean in the U.S. context of civil military relations? The fact that we're having this discussion, um, and you know, we wonder what would happen to the, the state bureaucracy. Would there be a mass resignation? Would the job of a bureaucrat under a Trump administration would that be to to serve the president's objective, or would it be to restrain? Would it be to mitigate? Hmm. the negative consequences of a Trump administration. So in a way, you're sort of, you're not undermining per se, but in a way, you're kind of undermining your own president from within the bureaucracy. That's yeah. a scary conversation to be having in America. It is. But that's one that, you know, But if that happened, if Trump wins, you know, we're going to do what people should do in any kind of democratic context, which is fight for our beliefs and our ideas. And if they are the right ideas, you hope that, at some point that they will win out and people will come to their senses. And if people don't come to their senses, then there's also a sense of like, hey, people people should be able to vote for very bad, destructive leaders if that's in fact what they want. Huh. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think, see, the, see, see the, 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 the thing, Shadi, is that I, I don't think anyone... Uh, sort of, or or at least for most people that we happen to have conversations with, disagree with the with this idea that 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 the, that the very possibility of a Trump presidency or the fact that he is now, like as Zucky said, has a fifty percent chance of winning the highest office in the land is sort of unprecedented just by virtue of the kind of candidate that he is. Like you said, someone who questions the very fabric of of of, of liberal democracy. Someone who, I mean, it, you know, you're you're talking about 
the you know in terms of questioning the outcome of the election uh i mean to my knowledge there's only been one of the two candidates who's actually called that in even as a possibility right i mean someone who's sort of sort of baited his his his, his base uh in terms of well if the election doesn't go our way then 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 you know, we we need to question uh the legitimacy of that election um the the, the I, I guess to me the greater question perhaps is how did we get here like you know how did eight years of Obama uh, get us to the point we are? And, I'm, and it's probably a, ver a very big question, but I, I okay, mean, so, love okay, some yeah, of your yeah. thoughts. I'd love some of your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit controversial. Oh, like you have it so far? <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. Okay, so, look, um, look I, I haven't really developed this argument, but it's something that I've been thinking about. I don't know. If I can sort of get my head around, maybe I'll write something, which is, um, I think that eight years of a aloof, intellectually removed president who is, you know what, kind of smug and disdainful, I think, towards a lot of a lot of Americans quite I think I think that's kind of Obama's thing. And I think that, you know, we're a little bit exhausted from that, you know, and I think that people are they're just a kind of disaffection. And for people who kind of like separate, and I think that very few people have raised this link. When, when people try to explain Trump, they don't talk a lot about Obama, but it would seem a little bit odd if Trump was elected right after eight years of Obama. Presumably one has something to do with the other. Maybe it's, not, right. the main, maybe it's not the main thing, but I mean, it seems, it seems, and that, that's why I think it would taint Obama's legacy if Obama essentially sets that contributes to the laying of the groundwork for the rise of someone like Trump. And the most powerful man in the world, the president of the U.S., cannot be blameless in such a, in such a context. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I have some I have some ideas of what it might be. But like one thing, one thing is sort of Obama's Obama's style um, but I don't think Obama has been, and this kind of takes us a little bit, bit back to the foreign policy side of the equation. I think there's a sense that everything is falling apart around us, even if it isn't. And this is why when people say, well, hey, if you actually look at the truth, if you look at facts, the world is not necessarily worse today than it was at some point in the previous, whatever, few decades. This is the kind of like liberal, I think a liberal smugness, this kind of obsession with facts. And I think it's, it's you know, it's easy because yeah, facts are, you know, when people say, well, I, I even say it sometimes, I'll say, um, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts, which is sort of a very smug way of dismissing your intellectual opponents. Um, but uh, so I think that Liberals are very bad in America at understanding the emotional tenor of politics, that we are not necessarily rational actors. When people like list facts and charts, even I, I kind of glaze over, I'm like, I don't care. Who mm. cares? This is not what politics is about. Mm. We want to be moved. We want to be inspired. We want to feel secure and safe. We're afraid of people who don't look like us. We're, we like to scapegoat people that we disagree with. We're hu like, I mean, this, so I think that there's something there that we have to be more attuned to. I don't think Obama has really understood the emotional side of politics. He always talks about what works. It's a well, very technocratic, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, mean, I think what you're describing, though, is, is sort of like, Obama, the candidate, is very as a candidate was very different than what, 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 at least what you're saying, because I mean one can't deny that what sort of brought Obama into into office. It, it, it was that sort of appeal to the heartstrings. It was that ability to move us, to inspire us, right? Um, and but so I think what you're saying is that Obama as a candidate was fundamentally different than Obama as a president. Well, there's that, that's definitely part of it. You know what? Honestly, and I, I'm part of this. Look, I, I created my own Obama. I I wanted my I wanted a liberal fantasy, so I made someone up in my head. That's what I did. Right. And I think a lot of us we needed, 
you know, we needed to believe that this was possible, this was true, that there was someone called Obama who would look out into the distance, into the sun, uh -huh. and it would almost seem as if God had sent him upon us to, well, and, and, you know, I'm, because, yeah. I mean, well, the, what you're describing, I mean, that's something that he himself is cognizant of because he mentions this in, in one of his books, how he's sort of a, a, a blank slate that people have projected their uh, hopes and dreams onto. Okay, this is also what bothers me about Obama. Okay. Okay, he look, I'm all like I'm all for being super self aware and doing like meta narrative stuff and like, oh layers of you know, whatever, all that. And I you know, we're even doing it in this conversation to some extent. Fine, great. But what bothers me about Obama is that he does it in a very kind of, of like even that's like smug. When he's being like <laughs> ironic right. or self aware, it's only to actually just reinforce the point he's making. So it's almost like Oh, I've considered both sides of the equation, but I'm still right because I looked at the other side and I, I came to the same conclusion that I would have came to irrespective of anything else. I and mean, there's a sort of like, like there. And he, I think he also he feels good about the, the fact that he's so he's so smart and brilliant, intellectual, and he needs to like he needs to show us how smart he is. He's like, oh, I'm I'm being self aware. There's just something that's really off putting about it. And that's the other side. I think, there, I think there's a very genuine Obama who's a good guy. And then there's the guy who is in love with his own idea of himself. And I think that's actually a dangerous thing in a president, that this kind of intellectual arrogance. And, um, well, um, I mean, Shadi, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, because to <laughs> me, like, if I, if, if I just remove the word Obama, like the, the, like the name Obama, I mean, almost everything you're saying describes trump to a t in terms of like in terms of like except that the conservatives in this country have painted in broad strokes whatever they wanted to see uh you know you know they've created this sort of you know uh candidate that isn't necessarily trump but is representative of their of, of who they think uh, they want to see in power do you see what i'm saying yeah but no one thinks that no one thinks that trump is smart or brilliant or intellectual and he's Definitely except not self-aware. Except Trump. I mean, sorry. Except Trump. I'm saying. I mean, the, the, you know, <laughs> if you want to talk about smugness, I mean, you can't deny. You know, the like Trump's sort of the the way he comes across as being so full of himself and and yeah, but you know. see, but I, I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't describe Trump as smug, and maybe it's just like a sim. So yes, he's full of himself. He thinks he's awesome, but I think smugness Fine. is more I of a liberal agree. trait. It's like this <laughs> it's knowing, di trait. yeah, it's like this knowing <laughs> disdain because you know more facts than the other person, and like you're the enlightened one because you live in New York or D.C. and you've seen the light, and then all those like, like the white working class, they're just all a bunch of racists who are like irrational and voting against their own interests. It's just this very kind of like. And that's why, quite frankly, I think a lot of people don't like Democrats because they, we don't, you know, I don't know if we know how to speak to a certain, a certain part of the country that has actually, they look to the, they look to the Democratic National Convention. I remember thinking this while I was watching the festivities and thinking, wow, this is a festival of, of diversity and religious, colorful, everyone coming together, rainbow of of coming together stronger, you know, all that. All those vibes are great for me. I love that stuff, right? But I can imagine, like, someone, like, I don't know, I don't want to come up with some kind of cliche, but whoever you think would be the cliche in some part of the U.S., that person was watching the DNC and being like, okay, I'm watching this, but I don't, I don't recognize this. I don't relate to this. They're not speaking to anything that I grew up with that I see around me. That doesn't mean that person's necessarily racist. And by the way, we're all, I mean, like, you know, isn't everyone, like, everyone has some degree of bias. And I think it's very easy for us to dismiss people who support Trump and say, hey, they're, they're just a bunch of racists. That's why I actually did think Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment was actually kind of pretty problematic. I don't think that we should we should view our own fellow Americans, however flawed they might be, as deplorable. For God's sake, I have family members who support mass killing in Egypt. But so sorry, I don't mean to introduce like a new idea. But by, <laughs> by this, 
but by this time, <laughs> like, I have family members, people who are yeah, apparently right. like yeah. you know dear to me that I like. They're otherwise good people who literally support the mass killing of their opponents. In other words, they support the military and CC against Islamists or the yeah. Brotherhood or whatever. Right. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to go around thinking that they are deplorable people. Are they deplorable? That's an interesting philosophical question. How do otherwise good people come to support evil things? Um, you know, it's an open question, but I think that we shouldn't be smug about the answers. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I think well, that that yeah. question is actually a good place to leave this conversation because it's certainly, <laughs> yeah. it's certainly no, something I, for people to chew on. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and I didn't want to, I mean, as I, I think I, 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 I do agree, uh, Shadi, with the overall assessment that, I mean, I think what we're talking about, what's happening in the United States is is this sort of fundamental cultural divide in terms of the way we, we view the country, the way we view each other. Um, because to me, you know, what you were describing as, you know, say, you know, as the, you know, Joe Sixpack walk, watching the DNC was the reaction I was having watching the RNC. So, I mean, I hmm, think we're just, there's, in, a, in a lot of ways, we're, we're, we're talking yeah. past each other. I mean, you know, that, hey, this isn't the America that, that I believe in, or this isn't the America that 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 I I, I feel as though I belong to, um, and I think you know I think what has changed is that as much as Joe Sixpack can say it, uh, you know we you and I and Shizaki and we we all have we we, we 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 can argue for our own America as 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 bona fide Americans as anybody else, and I think that's what's I think fundamentally changed in this country is the fact that you know. Uh, we have had a Browning effect in America, and people are viewing the world differently. So, or viewing their like, well, like what their country means to them differently. Yeah, I'll just say I know you know we got to close up, but I mean I feel like we're having a sort of, I maybe not I don't know brown people as a kind of general term, but I mean Muslims yeah. are sort of having a coming out moment in America where right. you actually turn on the TV and you see Muslims on TV and they're not like doing terrorist or either. So they're not, they're not necessarily terrorists, but they're also not necessarily fighting terrorism. Cause that's, you know, um, and it's like cool to have like characters. I'm just thinking now about the night of where you have a character mm. who's quite cl clearly identifiably Muslim, but there's no terrorism, you know, that's, he's not, you know, he's just a person right. who's caught up in a problem who happens to be Muslim. So I think, or when we saw Hizr Khan on, on you know, various TV shows and, of course, the DNC. And I feel like – and I, it's also nice to see how Democrats and liberals – because I said, I said mean things about liber liberals and their <laughs> smugness a few minutes ago. So just to kind of <laughs> offer the other side of it, you know, I think right. it's nice to see liberals rallying around Muslims and saying, hey, we're going to speak out unequivocally about anti-Muslim bigotry and the fact that – top U.S. politicians, including Hillary Clinton and any number of other Democrats, are going out of their way to be, to be inclusive towards Muslims and to, and to talk about us as if we're, you know, we're a, a real part of the fabric of this country. I think that is, that's, that's encouraging. It's inspiring. It makes me kind of hopeful in a weird way. Yeah. But how about... Mm -hmm. I'm just going to end with hopeful because I almost never end conversations with that in the last sentence. So, let's, you know, I'm done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, uh, I guess from your mouth to God's ears, man, in, in terms of uh, uh, ending on a hopeful note and seeing where where we end up, uh, you know, in, in just a little over a month in terms of uh, the election or the outcome of the election. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, yeah, interesting. Anyway, um, Zucky, why don't we close out? I, I know that, uh, we've taken, uh, a lot of Shadi's time. I hope that the listeners have enjoyed the show. I know we talked about a lot of different sort of, uh, like what would seem to be disparate things, but I think there was sort of an overarching sort of, uh, you know, theme going on. So I hope people and, enjoyed. And I just want to say to our listeners, if you want to think of this show as a blank slate to project your hopes and dreams onto, <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. So by all means, <laughs> but uh, Sh Shaddy, the new book is out right now. Where can people find you online? Yeah. Um, so they can find the book Islamic exceptionalism at their local bookstore on Amazon, you know, 
uh, are there independent bookstores still? I don't know. Maybe in some places. I was going to say, just support your <laughs> order bookstore. So uh, try I think, to go I out think we're at a stage now where just saying find it at the bookstore pretty much means Amazon at this point. Uh, oh yeah, people might have been like, okay, Shaddy said local bookstore. Wait, what is he? T what yeah. is that? The, the, <laughs> the words. I understand the words, but that phrase doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah. But also, like, people can follow me if they want to, you know, if they want to hear me pontificate more, if they're into that sort of thing on Twitter. My <laughs> handle is Shadi Hamid, just my name. Yeah. Very cool. And, and Pervez, as far as uh, you have a Twitter handle, too, I believe? Uh, that I barely use. And, and you were going to help me rebrand, remember? So yeah, when your, we your handle's put, kind of a mouthful, right? When we put a pin in it, yeah. Uh, Zucky's is much easier to remember. Yeah, my, my name is Zaki's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my Instagram handle. That's also my website, just add .com. You can also find uh, my movie reviews at the Huffington Post. And um, as far as this show, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. I want to thank everybody for sending in uh, the emails that they have and also the uh, reviews that they've uh, posted on iTunes. We will have those coming up on a future episode. But on behalf of my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, and our guest, Shadi Hamid, I want to thank everybody for listening. And hopefully you will catch us next time. Thank you.